Jose Fernandez, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. We're getting past the technical issues and we're pushing through. <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. Ron. My pleasure. It's a pleasure. No, my pleasure. Thank you. For, I know you said thank you for hanging in with you, but thank you for hanging in with me. So I, I do appreciate it. And, and I've been long stalking you since 2016. So thank you for uh, keep answering my emails and um, and coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate you uh, not giving up on me. I, I look forward to spending a little bit of time with yeah, you. Yeah, we spent more than I expected. I must admit, <laughs> with the technical issues, but that's that's <laughs> not a problem, not a problem at all. But uh, anyone that doesn't know who you are, Jose, do you want to give a bit of a background on yourself? Um, what you've done previous to going to Saudi, because I know there's been a few changes recently, and, yes. uh, and then work back from there. Yeah, so let's let's just start from where I am right now. I'm in, currently in Saudi Arabia. I'm I'm leading the sports science department for Mahat Academy, which is a uh, it's an academy. Uh, it's part of the Ministry of Sports, a new initiative aiming to develop sporting success and identify um, athletic potential in the country. So a very exciting project. I've only been here for three months, so learning as I go. But um, but um. Uh, exciting road ahead for for us for sure um before that i was in major league baseball with the houston astros for six years i started being the sports science analyst for them for a couple of years and then for the last four years i became the the head of sports science so another really exciting experience for me i think i learned a lot I, i had the opportunity to uh to work alongside bright bright minds and and amazing athletes so it was it was an incredible opportunity for me and then before that um just to uh, to keep it short i was um in the uk for five years i was consulting mostly uh with professional teams there Uh, a a little bit of consulting work as well in the area of athlete monitoring and and data aggregation and integration and analysis for for different organizations there it's a it's something that I never planned. Uh, it started um, just going there almost on a part-time work with, with one football team, and then I ended up being there for five years. So, again, having, having the opportunity to, to work, you know, at that age I was very young and not a lot of experience, but to work and actually see uh, how coaches from different organizations work and have the opportunity to, uh, to add a little bit uh, of input to what they are doing, it was, it was also great. And then from an educational point of view, I... I I'm a sports science uh, degree uh, from the University of Madrid. I have my postgraduate studies as well from the University of Madrid. And, and then a lot of informal education. I'm just trying to stay updated on, on a number of things. Nice. So the move to Saudi, was that always on the cards? Was that something that, an opportunity that came up that you couldn't turn down? What was this, how did that happen? Yeah, no, it was an opportunity. I, I, I never thought it was going to happen, and uh, but... Um, I learned about the opportunity and I've always been intrigued by really big sports science projects, right? So not just working with one team and 12 athletes, but, you know, when I was working in baseball, now all of a sudden you're working with one professional team and five minor minor league teams and two high performance centers in, you know, one in the Dominican Republic and another one in your spring training facility. So you, you know, I'm, I'm, enjoying working in this type of very complex environments and i thought the the project here in saudi was the logical next step because it's not just working for one team and one sport but it's actually working with uh, i think the target is 22 sports in a few years at the moment we'll have just four sports but building building this type of infrastructures for uh, for a whole country in different locations uh, collaborating with ministry of education as well not just of the ministry of score to to uh, to to establish a project to try to identify talent and working with the schools to, to be able to assess and evaluate and monitor like mass number of athletes across the country. So when I heard about it, I was immediately interested. Um, it was a new project, it was a new challenge, and so it was a, a good next step for me. So here I am. From the outside, it would look like baseball, based on the films and media and things like that. They obviously go deep on the data side, but on the sports science side, how does it differ from what they expect of you or compared to like soccer, compared to, compared to football? And how are those two sports, from your experience, using sports science? Yeah, you, you mean here in Saudi? How, what is the difference between now and what I was doing before? 
No, in between like the Astros, what you were doing at the Astros from from a um, a sports science perspective versus what you were doing in England with yeah, okay. how they were using sports science. How do they differ? Because on the on the on the surface, from my knowledge, little bit of knowledge of baseball, yeah. it would seem that they are going deep on the sports science side and the data side. Would that be true? Yeah. So, right? yeah. I mean, it is true, but there are a couple of things that are important here. So when I was working in the UK, it was, I mean, sports science is not new. It's been here for, for more than 10 years, for sure. But at the time I was working with teams in the UK, it was the first time some of those teams were starting to acquire like GPS technology. Very recently after that, there were the first force plays being implemented with some teams. Uh, so force plays have obviously, obviously been there, but more at a university level and a research level that actually applied on the field. The same with technology like hamstring strength devices and things like that. So I think at that point, uh, there was a lot of, uh, okay, well, there's a lot of technology starting to come in in sports that we want to use, but it's never been used before, at least not in this environment. And also there's not a lot in there on managing all that new data. Right, um, because when, when I was working in the US, I think there was, in the UK, I think there were probably one or two athlete management systems and they were not developed to the point where, you know, they are developed now in terms of integrating and automatic aggregation of the data and all those type of things. So I think that's, that's one difference. I think the timing is different between my job in the UK, which was very early, and, and now in the US that you know, it was a little bit more established in terms of technologies and things like that. And then like what you said is true. Um, I think there is a lot of interest in baseball in going deep into data in general, not just sports science. When I, when I arrived and I started working in baseball in 2016, that was the case, I think, more on the sport, on the technical and tactical side of things, not so much on the performance side of things. Um, it was very basic when I started working in 2016 in terms of the data we were collecting from a performance point of view. Uh, that was the first year, for example, that was implemented in baseball, the optical tracking system in the stadiums. And there wasn't a lot of technology at that point being deployed with the team um, in, in, in regards to sports science or performance. So for me, it was a lot of, okay, focusing on, okay, first, what do we need to understand? What are the requirements of these sports? Because if you look at, if you look at the demands of baseball and the research that is out there uh, in 2016, there wasn't much more than just a few studies on biomechanics, but nothing from um, um, you know actual physical demands on the sports. Okay, what is the work to rest ratio? What is the number of sprints? You know, what was the was the type of effort that the guys have to do uh, in the game? So for me, it was creating or starting to create that infrastructure to start familiarizing myself with what we are training for and what are the goals in terms of developing these athletes and, and what are we preparing them for. Um, so, so that's how it started. And then from there, just uh, starting to elaborate to, okay, well, let's go from something a little bit more basics to see how can we actually impact performance a little bit more in terms of the data that, that we're collecting. So take us through that, that, that five-year journey starting in 2016. At what point did you get that to in 2021 before you left? What kind of things were you doing yeah. that you were, I suppose, what you were proud of and what you'd what you'd worked up to? Uh, well, I think creating a, an infrastructure able to support some of the decision making behind. And, and when I say decision making, it's not just decision making with regards to strength and conditioning, which is what we usually think about when it comes to sports science. We work collecting data in the weight room, collecting external load data and internal load data. I think, I think my, my work there was more, um, it, it reached a little bit beyond just the, the traditional uh, understanding of sports science to influence the way like we're recruiting players, for example, how do we, how do we help our scouting department with some of the decision making? Because at the end of the day, they are making decisions on things like, okay, what is the physical projection of these players, for example. And that that is something that we can help them along. At the end of the day, we're using very similar technology, we're collecting similar data, and we can help them think through, through those processes in a little bit more objective way, rather than just saying this player is a is a two in power, but we're projecting that in five years it's gonna be a number six in play, or it's gonna be similar to 
to this player that is currently playing in the league. I think I think we can help make that process a little bit more objective and support those decisions with with a lot of the knowledge that we have as a sports scientists and that we are familiar with. So to be able to do that, I'm guessing that you had to be, become very ingrained within the coaching staff and be able to talk their language and get the trust, I suppose, get the trust. And that comes up all the time in the podcast, building the trust with the technical coaches. How did you go about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it starts from uh, taking it slowly and going step by step, showing value in any way you can. At the end of the day, there's two things that you have to achieve. One is with your work, try to impact. One is performance, two is probably injuries. Try to keep the players healthy, try to help the players win more, win, win, win more games or, or uh, perform better. The other part is make the life of the coaches that are working with you easier, right? So, so that you are, you are helping them save time, make better decisions and things like that. So starting, starting very, very simple with uh, some of simple wins that you can, you can identify at very early stages and, and develop some solutions for those and then, um, and then just grow from there. I think once you are able to help them at early stages and, and they feel that you are not just there to say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're collecting this data now and now you have to change your training because this technology is saying that this number is now red instead of green. I think it's more about helping them think through that process and, and coming up with, a, you know, coming up with a decision as a team, uh, and you are just supporting that decision process rather than just saying, but the way you are supporting that decision process is through an infrastructure that allows you to not just give one opinion, because at the end of the day, they have been working there for longer than me. They know the sport better than me. They, they give probably more valuable opinions than the one I can give, but trying to, to be critical about those opinions and trying to support certain, uh, certain conversations with as much objective data as possible. It's, it's, not, it's not always possible to get data for every single conversation that you are having, but at least try to create an infrastructure that can support that, that process as much as possible. Is there any examples that you can give, Jose, where you were able to create something in the background that was ha- that was saving coaches time? Because anyone, whether you're a coach, whether you're a builder, whether you're a what designer, whatever you are, if someone comes and says, I can save you time, like I'm listening, I'm buying it. So that's so obviously that's so important, especially in a a fast moving industry like baseball. So how we is there any examples that you can give of how you save the coach's time? Yeah, so keeping it I mean I'm 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 not gonna go into specifics, but trying to be general and still be concrete about some of the things that we've done. I think for me, the first goal that I had was, apart from trying to understand the sport, um, okay, when we arrived, there wasn't much in terms of objective information to one help prescribe training, for example, or help evaluate where the, co- the players were getting better or maintaining certain adaptations during the season or not. So my, my first goal was like trying to profile those you know, those players in, in very simple ways, because when you, do, when you don't have much at, at the beginning with very simple things, you can start getting a, a, some, some quick gains into that process. Now, so the way I look at athlete profiling, which is some of my first goals when I arrived there was, I, I tried to think about it in, in three different buckets, which is um, aerobic fitness, force. And when I say force, I'm talking about max force, but also about, uh, forced by time, so basically power-related capabilities. And the third bucket is probably going to be a speed. And within a speed, we have you know things like change of direction, acceleration, and things like that. I think those three buckets are not just important for the sport, but are probably universal for most sports. And then you can customize a little bit based on your environment and based on, on where you are actually working. But if I think about those three buckets, I think in most sports, we're going to be able to prescribe training data with uh, training programs with that information. I think in most sports, aerobic conditioning and especially force and power uh, are going to be in some way related to performance on the field or on the court, right? And I'm not saying if you are stronger, you're going to score more from, you know, from the three. But when you look at the sport from a specific actions, like there are certain things that start to, to correlate, right? Okay, so changing of direction. Um, 
uh, ability to uh, be explosive in certain actions, for example, throwing a ball at 100 miles per hour, uh, swinging with certain power, right? So then you start looking at that, that component of, okay, these things are helping me from a training prescription point of view and also probably going to have an impact on the performance of the players in the field. So they're going to be important. The second part from there is, um, especially if you're working in American sports where schedules are very, very dense and heavy, um, usually players that are stronger, players that are aerobically fit, they are the ones that are going to cope better with with that stress, right? Ability to recover faster between high intensity efforts or even from game to game. So, so I think those three things right there are going to be pretty, pretty efficient in terms of the importance of that information and how much you can use that to, uh, to improve your training program. Um, the other part, so let, let's go, cause I know you want to know a little bit more specific. So let's go into how do we collect the data, for example. So for, uh, for aerobic, for a, a aerobic conditioning, usually I look at a field assessment, an interval field assessment, which is either a 3015 or a yo-yo type of assessment on the field, a yo-yo IFT. And we could, we usually, I like to do that usually within somewhere between at least once per quarter. So somewhere between eight to 12 weeks, get uh, an updated score on, on that type of assessment. Um, from a strength and condition, sorry, from a force and power, um, I like in, in baseball, um, and this is this is interesting because a lot of people say, "Oh, the schedule is so heavy. You play 162 games. You're not going to bring the players up to to anywhere near sub max lows." When actually, I think from a philosophy perspective, I actually like to to bring them up because when you break down the schedule, there are plenty of opportunities to load the players. The schedule and the games are not the same, uh, depending on how they are combined and and you know the, the interaction between one game and the next one. So actually. Um, with our team, I, I like to bring the players up to near max load um, every four or six weeks. And by mar near max load, I, I'm talking in a week, uh, we're gonna be bringing the players up to probably anywhere between two to four reps with a barbell speed of somewhere between 0 0.1, 0 0.3 meters per second. And right there, automatically, you're gonna have an updated uh, uh, repetition maximum estimation, right? And this is part of training. This is not an actual assessment. We're, we're training with those loads and we're capturing uh, those updated max strength RMs estimations every four or six weeks. And uh, I, I do know, like, I don't, I don't want the VBT gods to, I know, uh, <laughs> I, I know RMs change every day, uh, but I, I'm still a little bit traditional. If we are bringing the players up, I want to have some, I'm more interested in, in the changes from training cycles to the next training cycle rather than just going day by day or even week by week. Because at the end of the day, I'm not thinking about fatigue changes. I'm thinking about adaptations from training. Uh, to complement that, and especially recently in previous years, we didn't do that at the beginning in baseball, but, but when we started having force plates um, after two or three years, um, um, then you can start looking into more specific type of force profiling with uh, based on the uh, specific positions that are going to be most specific to the movements that players are doing on, on the actual field. So for example, like you can, you can do an isometric uh, squat assessment uh, on the force plates and specific degrees of knee angle that are somewhere specific to what a baseball player is doing on the field and understand what they are producing in terms of force capability, uh, sorry, peak force and, and rate of force development. And then you can compare that with two things. You can compare that with what the players are doing or, or the dynamic force that they are expressing in a, in, a, in a jam type of assessment, in a more dynamic assessment, more power related assessment. Um, and the other part is that in baseball these days, we, we have access to, and, and this is not any secret, most of the teams have like force plates on the mound and, and they're collecting very granular data on players performing actually actions, uh, sport ask, motions or actions at a very high intensity level. So, so immediately you can compare whether a player is able to express certain levels of force physically in an isolated movement that has nothing to do with the sport. And then you bring that player into a specific motion at a high intensity and, and you are able to compare if there are any deficiencies in there because that immediately can give you a clue whether it's a technical fault or whether it's that the player is not physical, 
physically ready to actually create certain levels of force. Um, so from a, from a training perspective, now you can, you can start giving advice on, okay, well, let's work from a more technical correction point of view. Is it a sequence problem? Is it a timing problem? Is it a, you know, any type of coordination that a coordination problem or more complex problem, or is it a, is it a purely output problem that we have to develop in the weight room, for example, right? Um, uh, and then from, from force and power, I said, I, I like similar to what 99% of the teams are doing these days using, using force plays and, and collecting data. And I think here the difference is not the actual assessment that you're doing, which mo most people are doing very similar assessments, but is, is that research that you do on the background to, to try to filter a little bit that noise within the force plays and try to understand what are the metrics that are more important for your specific environment. And, and for a point guard in basketball, it might be this and this metric because this is important for what they have to do on the court. And for a baseball player, it might be two or three other metrics. Uh, I would imagine that for certain sports, we're going to be talking about very similar metrics. But I think doing this type of research for us was, um, was very helpful to, to filter through all that amount of information. But all of a sudden, when you start using technology like force plus you, you all of a sudden you start getting and you don't know you don't know what to use for your training decisions and then from a from a speed point of view that was the third bucket that i mentioned um very simple things like uh, i like to use the speed guess and i like to to profile in baseball we used to use 30, uh, 30 yards because that are specific to first base distance so 30 yards with the splits in between and get an idea of acceleration and max speed profiles and then you can elaborate on top of that with video analysis or you can add uh, more specific technique type of assessments with you know there are technologies like 1080 and things like that, that that you want or even now computer vision and and this type of skeletons that you are able to do whether those are reliable or not that's that's for another day but but, but at least at least you know that we're starting to you know to you can elaborate a little bit more on top of that uh, speed assessment that you are doing and the important thing here is and, and i want to be very clear on this is not so much about testing it's like okay well as part of training we're, we're sprinting as part of training we are doing max strength as part of training we are doing aerobic fitness type of sessions well let's find opportunities to measure that objectively and, and update our database with new information so that when something happens if a player gets hurt, we have updated benchmarks. If if we have to make specific training adjustments, we can go back and check what the player has been doing in training and, and, and understand where the player is coming from. So those, those type of things, that's, that's a little bit the way I think when I, when I think about um, building uh, an infrastructure of, of, of data. And it's, uh, it's super simple. It's just three things, but I think those are very universal and can provide a lot of value. With the stress that's on the upper body, in, specifically in baseball, was there anything that <laughs> was there any sort of profiling that would happen in that area? I'm guessing there is. Huge, huge question yes. for uh, yeah. for someone working in baseball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, there is. Um, um, so what I didn't mention before is that that's what I those three buckets are more performance based type of buckets, but then. There are other parts that I like to look at. Okay, then we can be a little bit more granular in terms of prevention. Um, and prevention is hard, but but you can understand what, based on the epidemiology of injuries of your sport, where you probably need to pay a little bit more attention. So for us in baseball, it's shoulder, elbows, and, and hamstrings, right? So yes, for, for baseball, we were looking at isometric assessments, uh, isometric strength assessments uh, with a couple of options. Uh, and and it's, it's not new here. There are two options that are probably using, again, 99% of the things. One is things that you can do with the force frame or, or with the Kanga Tech type of technology, which is assessments of internal, external rotation, getting an idea of balance uh, and maximal outputs there uh, um, from an isometric point of view. And then we have um, with the force plays, you can do things like the AS force, uh, sorry, the AS uh, uh, test. Um, to look at an idea of rate of force development of shoulder, which won't provide information from a, from a posterior shoulder point of view, but you get an idea of, of some of the RFD numbers that the players are able to display. So yes, the, the, the thing here is um, trying to integrate that more within the schedule of, uh, obviously for, for position players in baseball is probably not that important, although eventually every, every 
few number of weeks we will update those benchmarks. It's a lot more important for pitchers just because of, of what they have to do on every single game. Uh, so then we will try to pair that data collection of those other scores based on when they pitch and, and get an idea of how they are recovering from, from games and, and if there is anything that we can do to, to adjust and, and prepare for the, next, for the next outing. I don't want to make this a technology chat, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You've mentioned computer vision and whether that's reliable and that's potentially, excuse me, that's potential for another day. But what do you think is the next thing? What do you think is the next thing that will be brought into game space, sports like baseball? Um, yeah, what do you, where do you think sports science is heading on on the tech front? So I think three things. Um, first, doing more with less, and I'll, I'll I'll get to this later. So doing more with less. Uh, that's one thing. But. Addressing your question specifically, I think if you look at sports, so if you look at sports science jobs in baseball, for example, over the last year and a half, you will see all of a sudden a lot of jobs for biomechanics, right? And this is because uh, there's new technology coming into the field. There's Hawkeye technology, which is an optical tracking system that is not just tracking how a player moves on the field, but it's actually getting data from every join uh, of the player. Uh, I think it's every 25. 25 times per second, I believe, that's the frequency that they are getting. So all of a sudden, now you have a wealth of biomechanical data coming from the actual game, not from a biomechanical analysis that you are doing outside of the game. So imagine, imagine all the questions and all the, all the information that all of a sudden uh, teams are, are having, right? And this is something that started being implemented last year um, for all the teams. It's something that is provided by the league. And, and now this year, I believe, is... Uh, is 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 just becoming more and more important. Um, so that's one thing. I think computer vision type of um, assessment uh, or type of data is is only going to grow in the next few years. And when I say grow, it's probably maybe new technologies, but also more accurate technologies. Um, at the beginning, it was very inaccurate. Now it's probably a little bit better. I, I don't. I, I think it's still challenging to get good data, especially in, in very fast motion. So if you look at baseball, I believe shoulder during a pitch is moving at 7,000 degrees per second, I believe. So tracking, tracking the velocity of the wrist uh, yeah, is, uh, is going to be challenging for technologies if they are moving at that speed, especially if the camera is really far and, and you don't have any sort of sensors. You are just basically estimating where the center of the joint is and trying to add a marker there on top of the video. Um, so I think, I think in terms of reliability and in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the power of the technology, I think things are only going to get better. The other part of the trend, I think, is more on the, on the, the analysis uh, and the capability type of things, like versus a few years, a few years when we were talking about statistics and about uh, more basic analysis, now we have the ability to, to do, uh, to implement methodologies that are able to deal with very complex data sets. And I think, Again, this is only going to grow uh, over time, mostly because uh, what something that was very hard to do before uh, programmatically now is open source. And now there are many people developing packages that are making all this process a lot easier from a, from a user uh, like me. I can, I can just go understand the package and know how to do certain type of analysis that a few years ago, I wasn't able to do because I had to go deeper into the maths behind the method and, and do it myself from scratch, right? Now, all that is becoming a little bit more easier for the user. And I think there are many options uh, or, or there's starting to be a few options that are making that process a lot easier. So it's becoming more implemented and it's, it's, be, uh, it's, it's been more integrated within processes, I think. So when I say more complex, I'm, I'm talking about like things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and those type of things. And then the other thing, the trend is like, I, I think that we should, we should look at all of this from a certain perspective and understand there's so much value in there, but, but there's also a lot of things that we can solve without collecting a lot of data or without collecting any data, right? And I, I'll give you an example. I think, I think when I started working in baseball, I had a lot of emails from companies about measuring sleep and things like that. And I, and I believe, I believe sleep is, is really important, right? It's one of the sleep nutrition, you know, training is, is one of the pillars of, you know, athletes performance, athletic performance. But if you look at the environment in baseball, 
you know that the players are sleeping not well at all. You don't, you don't need to measure it, right? You just focus on, okay, I can improve the environment. And when the environment is optimized to a certain degree, they can start worrying about implementing technology and measuring something. But at the beginning, why are you going to measure something that you know that is crap to start with? You can just, you can just focus on, on improving the environment directly and using those resources and budget to improve it and use the technology when it's going to be more meaningful to you. So things like, okay, well, maybe instead of uh, using a wristband to measure a sleep, then I can just focus on buying better pillows or buying, you know, putting an AC in a room for players. You know, many minor league players might not have AC in the rooms, right? Um, or traveling better, getting better buses to travel from one city to another city, or improving the way you are flying from one city to another city, or the timing of your flights, or those type of things. You, again, you just have to observe your environment, understand where you can you can get quick wings without actually measuring things. Uh, you just just be a little bit more patient sometimes. And there's, there's so much pressure for us for scientists mm. these days to use technology and, and do something with it's it. It's because people come up, people come on podcasts and get asked questions about technology by fools like me. <laughs> no, I mean, but but this yeah. this is great. Yeah. We, we should speak about it, but I think we need to be we need to be critical about it, and that's one of the things that a good quality for a sports scientist is to be very critical and be skeptical and, and understand when to prioritize, especially when, when you work, when you work in a professional organization, you're going to be pulled in a hundred different directions all the time. So, okay. How do you spend your time and where do you invest your resources? How do you prioritize that? Knowing that your goal is helping the team win and, and, and helping prevent injuries and keeping players healthy and helping your team find better players to join the organization. So start prioritizing based on those goals and not based on, you know, um, doing something because <laughs> Jose Fernandez went on rock podcast and, and you know, talk yeah, about first yeah. place, for example. One big question for you, and you've mentioned computer vision, you've mentioned camera systems. When it comes to wearables, are wearables in those environments in the field? Are we moving away from wearables? Are wearable, wearables going to be dead? No, I think wearables. I think if I like your remark in the field, I think that is really important, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think wearables on the field. I, uh, I, we, we use wearables on the field on the time, and I think, I think it provides really valuable information. So examples are like obviously GPS, IMU type of sensors that are very common in the sports. But I think in, uh, yeah, in an environment like baseball, we can think about using a sensor for the bat, and all of a sudden you have information about uh, the swing plane, the swing power, the, the 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 motion of the hands with regards to the body, those type of things, right? So I do think well used, um, and if you know what you want to get out of them, and if the technology is valid and reliable for the movement that you are trying to to evaluate, I think there's so much value in in using sensors, I think it provides information like G forces, for example, that, that you are not getting from camera. You are you are probably estimating, but you are not directly measuring them. So I think I do think there's valuable in, in wearables on the field. I'm not super convinced that there's valuable that there's value of wearables outside of the field, like measuring 24 hours type of readiness, fatigue, all these type of things. And I'm, I'm not just saying this based on whether the technology is reliable or not. I know there's so much debate with the hope. Uh, I know people <laughs> I know people say, oh, a ring is reliable. The hope is not so reliable. There's research about, you know. Uh, I'm not saying about that. That's obviously a big question and you need to understand what you're getting. But it's more, um, okay, if, if you work in a very complex environment when you have one or two coaches for 30 or 35 players, um, how much can you use 24 hours information from many of those players and make changes on a daily basis, right? So that's, that's what I'm going with, very basic bu bu buckets for athlete profiling. Just focus on simple things that can guide your training process and understand whether a player is, is, is getting better from one training cycle to the next one or from one micro cycle to the next one. Uh, rather than trying to optimize 99% the recovery ability of the player from one went to the another one, when the environment itself is, is, is something that is going to be, that is something that is going to be really hard to do in most professional sports environments. Now, 
always between brackets. If you want to use a sensor with a specific player because you want to understand certain habits of his lifestyle, then go ahead and do it if the player is happy with that and you can learn something about it. But deploying them at a mass scale, in my experience, is, is, is really hard to do. So just going back five or ten minutes, it sounds like to me, for a, the sport the, the sport scientist of five years' time, the sport scientist of ten years' time, Data analysis, biomechanics. And the, the the first one we'll kind of take care of, but the second one is interesting that you say biomechanics. Because if you go on social media and you get into looking at the, the sprint guys, so whether it be here in the, <clears throat> in the UK or over in the US, looking at joint angles, using apps, using cameras, that's biomechanics. So getting deeper on those levels people are already going that way so to have that deeper understanding even in not even in but in situations like developing acceleration top speed mechanics whatever that may be it sounds like to me them two are the areas that sports scientists maybe can differentiate themselves in having that deeper knowledge data analysis biomechanics would you agree i do agree i think that there is an opportunity to be a lot more granular in terms of the data that we're collecting for biomechanics now, and that requires specific expertise or a specific domain knowledge at least. And that domain knowledge, I, I, I have problem framing that whether this is a sports scientist area or a strength and conditioning coach area. I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, both of them are scientists in a way, right? And both of them need to be familiar with, you know, the, the, the sensors that we discussed before, the metrics that we're collecting from, you know, joint kinetics and kinematics and forces and all that. I don't think a strength coach can do a good job if he is not familiar with those type of metrics. Then we can discuss more or less how much he's going to interact with the data versus just consuming reports that someone else is providing for them, right? But that's another question. But in terms of understanding the data, having a specific domain knowledge of how to impact certain metrics and what certain results mean. I think, I think the strength analysis coaches have to get on board with that. It's not going to go away. And in fact, I mean, when you look at a lot of people, you know, talking about sprinting mechanics and all that, they are coaches. Mm. Yeah, no, you have, you have uh, Stuart McMillan and other people like in the UK, they, they are coaches. And I work with strength coaches. Uh, you have one on the podcast, Dan Hart. Yes. He knows much he knows much more than me about that. Sometimes I have to ask him to slow down, right? <laughs> now the other part of this is the data science side of things. I think here we can start making a little bit of a of a differentiation of how much a strength coach needs to develop that area and how much he's gonna use it versus um, the importance of that specific knowledge for a sports scientist. And when I say a sports scientist is the person who who tries to create that infrastructure of objective information to help to support the decision making process and and as part of that responsibility comes data management building reports building dashboards and and understanding what information provide for for the coaches i'm just writing i'm just writing down the three the three jobs that were kind of and this is this is this conversation but pre every other conversation data scientist sports scientist strength and conditioning coach and where them things intermingle, intertwine. Like, for instance, here in the UK, if you're a strength and conditioning coach in a football club, you've probably done a sports science degree and you've probably gone down the strength and conditioning route. But if you're a sports scientist, you've done a sports science degree again, but you've gone down the sports scientist route. So you could say that the strength and conditioning coach is a sports scientist as well, but maybe that's flipped in the US when you've got people going to strength and conditioning who are maybe more coaching led versus science yeah. scientist led. Yeah. Would that be right? I, I do agree. Which with... is where it gets a bit gray area of yeah. not that it like, is it maybe just been picky, but I find that there is this uneasy transitions yeah. between what is, what is what? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. I think a, a few months ago, I was doing a presentation on sports science for a, for a course in Spain. And I thought of a question similar to what you, you, know, what you just asked me. And I started looking for sports science job positions, adverts on the internet. And I came across many of them where sports scientists 
GPS scientists, data collection, you know, those type of things. And I think there is sometimes, uh, I don't want to say confusion. At the end of the day, teams ask for whatever they want and they call it however they want. That's, that's, not, for me to, that's not for me to judge. But, but I think the, the way I understand, I see it in three different levels, right? And when I say levels, I'm not saying one is more important than another. I'm saying levels of responsibilities. So I think the level one is the specialist. So we have the strength and conditioning coaches that are scientists, in my opinion, because they need to know the science of how the body works, you know, physiology, anatomy, all those type of things. Uh, and on top of that, it's even better if they make the process objective with objective information you know, as much as possible or, or whenever it makes sense, right? But they are, they are experts and they are scientists because they apply the scientific method to strength and conditioning and developing the athletic you know, side of things. In the same way, we have biomechanics that is special in motion analysis or movement analysis. We have nutritionists, they are also sports scientists. We have mental skill coaches, they are also sports scientists. Then we have level two, which is probably where, where I am, which is, and, and again, level two is not more or less, it's, it's, just, it's just trying to use these numbers to, to show different roles, all right? So level two is the person that supports those specialists with data and with information to help them navigate through the decisions that they have to make and, and support them. And, and, you know, and, and help in different ways, like, and a strength coach might not necessarily be an expert in technology, but you go there and say, okay, well, for you, it is important to measure barbell velocity. And these are the two or three technologies that I'm recommending based on, based on reliability, based on the feasibility of your environment to implement it and be successful and those type of things. So I think there's a mix between the, the person that thinks strategically about the data, the process, how to collect it, how to, how to manage it, and how to provide it for coaches. And, and as a sports scientist, like you said, many of them, myself, I have a strength and conditioning background and I became a sports scientist by default just because I started learning about data and, and, and specializing a little bit more. Um, and then the third level is the director of performance type of role, which in many cases comes from a sports science background, not always, but in many cases, comes from a sports science background because it's someone who has a lot of experience working or, or through the years through all these different specific areas of expertise. And now is someone who is able to integrate all those different um, specific knowledge or specific domain knowledge and make that people work together and stay on the same page to achieve the same goal, right? Uh, so what is a sports scientist? Well, you can work in any of those three levels and you are a sports scientist. It's just more about defining responsibilities, in, in my opinion. Talking too much sense, Jose. Far too much. <laughs> Far too much sense. I like it. So just on the kind of trends and where you see things going, because I quite like that, I quite like that, and your points of view on that. When it comes to athlete monitoring, we've, again, we've mentioned the camera systems, we've mentioned wearables, GPS, etc. Where do you think that area is going? Not only for baseball, but for other team sports uh yeah i mean that's, that's a good question i wouldn't know how to answer different from where we are right okay. now which is what i understand for athlete monitoring is finding ways to evaluate to, to monitor external load so volume intensity um of what the player is doing and then the other side of things is internal load, which is internal responses to that external load that the player is being exposed to. So where are we heading? I, I, I don't know. I think the technology can always improve. There might be better technology or not. But I don't think now, I think, I think we passed a little bit that boom of all of a sudden having an explosion of data. I think we passed that boom. I think we are starting to get to the point where maybe we're getting a little bit better at understanding how to use all that and you know, come up with decisions and, and, and managing all that information better. There might be always new technologies coming in and out, but I think it's, it's about now, I mean, we don't get now that excited about one new technology. Now we're trying to think deeper through that process and coming up with ways to, uh, to be better analyzing that data that is super familiar for everyone now working in this field. You know? so, so it's more about, where we're heading is about being much better about 
um, using the data, utilizing it to make better decisions through the power of better data analysis, people that are more prepared because a few years ago there were not people that were prepared to uh, to manage that data because they didn't have data science background. And I think there's universities now in, in the UK and Australia and the US teaching sports science students data analytics. And I think I think that's probably where we are now in that wave of we passed the technology boom and now we have to be better at using this. Would you agree that it's potentially the next phase? And I think we're there anyway, but even to a grander scale to be influencing other areas of the organization. Like you said, baseball recruitment's a huge thing. I'm just thinking of you in the UK in, in football, how many sports scientists are influencing recruitment? I may be wrong with maybe all doing it. That- but I'm not quite sure that's the case. So is the next thing for sports scientists to be infiltrating other areas of an organization? I 100% agree. I don't know why we try to limit ourselves to recovery and load monitoring when, you know, when player development, like, like you have a player, how do you make him better? Not just having him be more athletic or recover faster, but how do you make him a better player? Uh, in terms of even decision making and things like that, um, that's, that's, that's a huge area where I think a sports scientist can have a big impact. The other area is, like you said, athlete recruitment. Why are we not paying a lot more attention to that specific area where at the end of the day, the scouts and people working in this field are using sports science or physical information to supplement the information that they have about how good the player is at playing the sport, right? And I always put the same example. If you are a sports scientist uh, working for um, Barcelona, for example, football club, and you can have one Leo Messi playing at 100% every single game, or you can have three Leo Messi's played, playing at 75% every single game. Which team do you think is better? Three Messi's at 75% or one Messi at 99%? And this, this might be a stupid question, but at least I'm thinking about it, right? I'm, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. If I have two LeBron James at an 80%, if I am able to find a player that can have that impact or, or, or more players that can have a bigger impact um, or developing players much better, um, then a lot of my effort is going to be there. I think. I think having a better player has a bigger impact probably than having that player, uh, you know, having better players has a bigger impact than having one player optimized at 100%. I don't know. I don't know if this makes sense. I'm going it makes complete sense. It makes <laughs> yeah. complete sense. But, I'm definitely going with three messes at 75%. <laughs> I, I do think we are, they deserve some attention at least because sometimes we completely remove ourselves from those processes when I think, I think we can have a way bigger impact if we're able to help the organization find a star. Uh, or if not a star, like find players that are going to bring up the, the, you know, the value or that you can sell for more money and, you know, and use that money that you get to develop better players in your system because you're able to have more technologies or better coaches or things like that. I agree. Well, Jose, I'm going to round up there because although we recorded half of this last week, so I've taken up I've taken up double of your time compared to what I would normally do. Um, so if anyone wants to know more about you, what you're doing in Saudi Arabia, what you've done in baseball, what you're doing in football, etc., where's the best place for people to keep in touch with you? Uh, I think uh, Twitter. I, I try to be on Twitter. Uh, so I think what's my uh, at J Fernandez double underscore. Yep. I think that's my handle. And the other one is my GitHub page, uh, which is uh, github.com slash uh, josedv82. Um, and that's where I upload a lot of my analysis projects. Some of them are public and, and I like to share with with um, other coaches. So that, that's probably the, the best two ways to get in touch with me. Perfect. Well, I'm going to let you go because I know it's getting late there. Let you get on with your evening. But I uh, really appreciate your time and thank you for sticking with me over since 2016 with me with me dropping you emails every now and again and stalking you so i appreciate it jose no i, I appreciate you insisting on having me i, I really enjoy the chat <laughs> cheers jose speak soon okay take care rob thank you bye